Testing one, two. Are we good? All right, amen. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our third, uh, third, third night for our Daniel and Revelation seminar. How many of us are excited to be here this evening? Amen? Amen. Um, so we're very excited uh, to, go into the, to go into this seminar because there are a lot of people that was asking to do a Daniel and Revelation seminar. And so before we begin tonight, as we've been doing um, since starting yesterday, we're going to start off with a quiz uh, from the previous night. So for those who came last night to our seminar, what, what uh, chapter did we study in the book of Daniel last night? Daniel 7. Good job. Okay, so we have three questions this evening, and we're going to go up, start with the questions. You guys ready for the quiz? Okay, I have three items here, and... Whoever uh, I see their hand raises up first will get the prize, okay? All right, you guys ready? Question number one. What does wings represent in Daniel chapter 7? Did I see a hand? No one knows the answer? By the way, if you answered yesterday, you're, you cannot answer today, okay? The prizes need to spread for all of us. Okay, yes, we have contestant number one. Speed. Speed, correct. Good job. There you go. Congratulations, yes. Wings in the Bible represent speed or swiftness according to Matthew 23, 37 and Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verse 49. So what does wings represent again? Speed or swiftness. Good job. All right, question number two. What three nations does the three ribs in the mouth of the bear, Medo-Persia, represent? Oh, we have a hand right here. You can go to the mic and give, give your answer. Egypt, Babylon, Lydia, good job, good job. That is the correct answer. Here you go, you can claim your prize. It's a, it's a Bible bookmark. So the three ribs or nations that Medo-Persia conquered are Babylon that happened in 539 BC, Lydia, 546 BC, and last but not least, Egypt in 525 BC. All right, good job. You guys are answering the questions. Okay, we're gonna go to our third and final question. Here's the grand prize question. Ready, go. Who is the Ancient of Days represent? Is there a hand? I see a hand. Okay, you can, you can share your answer in the mic. Huh? I'll give you one more try. Who is the Ancient of Days represent? It represents God the Father. Good, correct. Good job. So if you, if you look in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, come, you can grab your prize. The Ancient of Days represents God the Father because, here you go, congratulations, because the Son of Man, the Son of Man is who, everyone? Jesus came to meet His Father in the most holy place. That's in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 13. The Son of Man represents Jesus, and the Ancient of Days represents God the Father. This happened in 1844 when Jesus moved from the holy place into the most holy place. Everybody understand? Amen? Okay. So before we go, we go on, we'd like to ask and pause for a word of prayer before we go into our study of Daniel chapter 8. So let us all bow our heads for a short word of prayer. Let us pray. Loving Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much 
for allowing us to be here this evening to study and to worship you this tonight. We want to invite your presence to be with us. We invite your Holy Spirit to be our true teacher, that he may lead us and guide us into all truth, that the truth shall set us free. Oh, Father in heaven, we want to invite our hearts and our minds to you this evening. And we ask you to please speak a word from on high. May you hide me behind the cross and speak through me. Taylor, make this message to each and every single individual here tonight. Father in heaven, I pray, Lord, that you would remove the enemy from this place and help us, Lord, to fully hear and understand the message that we'll be learning this evening. Thank you so much for your love and for your presence. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, everyone. Are we all ready to study? Everyone ready to study? Okay, I hope you brought your Bibles. I hope you brought a pen or a pencil. Or if you don't have that, uh, hopefully you brought a phone so you can take some pictures of some of the slides here. And just so you know, we're going to be giving out the slides uh, for all the presentations at the end of the seminar. And so after the seminar, we're going to give it to their, your dean and then she'll give it to you guys on the group chat so you guys can all have it together. Is that, is that good enough? Is that good? Amen. Okay. All right. We're ready to study Daniel chapter 8. I'm going to start, start off with an outline. In Daniel chapter 8, here is the simple breakdown of Daniel chapter 8. There are five things that happens in Daniel chapter 8. The first one is we're going to see the vision of a, a ram. The second one, we're going to look at the goat. The third is... This was a typo right here, so it's the little horn. The fourth one is the 2300-day prophecy slash the cleansing of the sanctuary. And last but not least, we're going to look at the interpretation. What does all of these things mean? What does the ram represent? What does the goat represent? What does the little horn represent? And what does the cleansing of the sanctuary mean to us practically today? And what, what can we do to prepare for the cleansing of the sanctuary? So this is the general, the basic breakdown of Daniel chapter 8. Are you guys ready to study now? We're going to go look at now the first one, which is the ram. So here is the ram. The ram is found in Daniel chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. And if you have your Bibles, you can open them up to Daniel chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. If not, we will put this, the, uh, the verses on the screen so everyone can, can read along and follow along. All right, so let's start off with Daniel chapter 8 and looking at verse 1. In Daniel 8 verse 1, it says here, let's read this together. Ready, go. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me, to me, Daniel, after the one that appeared to me in the first time. Now, I have a question. Just from looking at this verse alone in Daniel chapter 8 ver verse 1, we need to understand something. Who is King Belshazzar? Is King Belshazzar King Nebuchadnezzar? No, he's not. So who is King Belshazzar? Well, in order to ask, in order to understand who King Belshazzar is, we need to go look at the history books in order to define who King Belshazzar is. So who is King Belshazzar? We're going to look here. Basically, this is a list of all the kings that ever ruled in, the, in Babylon. Babylon ruled from 605 until when? 539 BC. During this time, during 605 to 539 BC, all these kings had ruled in the kingdom of Babylon. Now we have King Nebuchadnezzar the Great. He ruled for about 40, 42 plus years. Then after him came his son, Evil Merodach. Now what, what kind of name is Evil Merodach? How many of us want to have that kind of name? That kind of just sounds evil, right? Who, I mean, did you wake up in the morning and say, man, I can't wait to have a son, and I'm going to call him Evil Merodach. <laughs> this is kind of strange, but it's, it's recorded in, in history that his son, his name was Evil Merodach. He ruled for about two years. Then we have Nereglissar, which is the son-in-law of Nebuchadnezzar. He ruled for about... A, two years as well. Laboros Sorarkod, that's a hard name to pronounce. This is Negrissar's son. 
he ruled for about a year. And then we have Nabo uh, Nabodinus, son of Nebuchadnezzar. And then underneath Nabodinus, here's the most important one, King Belshazzar, grandson of who, everyone? King Nebuchadnezzar. Meaning to say, if you were to ask the question, who is King Belshazzar? King Belshazzar is the last ruling king of Babylon. Does that make sense, everyone? King Belshazzar is the last ruling king of the kingdom of Babylon. And he is also the grandson of King Nebuchadnezzar. Now, there's something interesting about Belshazzar, and we need to understand this point too. I'm going to put to you a list of things that, about King Belshazzar that we find in Scripture. In, in Daniel, we see that he is the last king of Babylon. In Daniel chapter 5, we see that he had a great feast or a fiesta. You guys remember the fiesta, the writings on the wall? This is what happened to King Belshazzar. And during this feast, he was drunk. He had multiple wives. The Bible says around a, th a thousand wives in Daniel chapter 5. And then it says that he worshiped idols. And while he's worshiping idols, while he's getting drunk, while he's having a fiesta, a party, he sees handwritings on the wall. And what, do you guys remember what was, what was the saying on the wall? What did it say? Wow, good job. It said, many, many tekel tekel you farsin, which basically means your kingdom has been stopped, you are found sin, uh, sinful, and your kingdom is going to be given into the Medes and the Persians. Good job, everyone. And in 539, what happened to King Belshazzar? He was killed by King Darius of the Medes in 539. You can read that in Daniel chapter 5 and the ending verses as well, how Darius was there to conquer the kingdom of Babylon. So who is King Bel Belshazzar, everyone? He is the last king of, the last reigning king of Babylon. And after this king comes Medo-Persia. Does that make sense, everyone? So far tracking? Okay, we're moving on. <clears throat> in Daniel chapter 8, verse 1, it says, In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me, to Daniel, after the one that appeared to me the first time. Question, where in the book of Daniel did this happen? When it says, after the one that appeared to me the first time. Where in Daniel chapter? Huh? Daniel chapter 7. It's the previous chapter. In Daniel chapter 7 is when he has a dream. In Daniel chapter 8, he has a vision. Does that make sense? The first time that, uh, that he was, I mean, the first time that he received a dream or a vision was in the previous verse. So Daniel chapter 7 contained his first dream. Daniel chapter 8 is now his vision that he sees in Daniel chapter 8. Does that make sense, everyone? Okay. Now, it basically happened in the previous chapter in Daniel 7. You guys are correct. Now we're going to move on. Now, we're, what we want to do is we want to kind of give a, a review of what we studied last night. I know last night it was, it was a, a challenging moment. You guys were here, yes? How many of us were here last night? It was very challenging. The rains and the thunders were coming. And, but what I want to do right now is just quickly show one or two slides to just recap what we studied about in Daniel chapter 7 because the dream or the vision that he has in Daniel 8 was almost parallel or almost similar to Daniel chapter 7. So we need to understand Daniel 7 real quick. Okay, in Daniel chapter 7, <clears throat> you have a what kind of a beast right here? A lion, which represented Babylon. The bear represented Medo-Persia. Leopard, Greece. Terrible beast, Rome. Ten horns, divided Rome. Little horn, papal Rome. And you have the judgment, which is the 2300-day prophecy. This is basically what we covered last night. For those, for those of us who wasn't uh, able to, to attend last night, we basically studied about these major beasts right here in Daniel chapter 7. Lion, bear, leopard, terrible beast, ten horns, little horn, and judgment. 
Now, to go into a little bit detail into Daniel chapter 7, I'm going to flash this on the screen. The first beast was likened unto a what, everyone? It was a lion, and this kingdom was the kingdom of Babylon. It had eagle's wings. What does wings represent? Speed or swiftness. In other words, this nation, the kingdom of Babylon, was a swift conquering nation. And then it says that its wings were plucked off. Uh-oh, all of a sudden, it's, it lost its speed. It's beginning to slow down. And then you see that it was lifted up from the earth and a man's heart was given it. Does it say that, the, a, that God's heart was given it to him? It says that a man's heart was given, it, given unto him. Then we have <clears throat> the second one was likened unto a... A bear. And who did this bear represent? Medo-Persia. Good job, everyone. It says that it was raised up on its side. So imagine the bear has four legs and it's raised up on one side, just something like that. And what do we realize? What, what was the meaning of the bear going on one side? It means that one of the... It was divided into two divisions, basically two it was one nation divided into two kingdoms, and the one that ruled the longest was not the Medes, but it was the Persians. Good job, everyone. We're going to see that later on in Daniel chapter 8 tonight. Then it says it had three ribs in its mouth. How many ribs? What were the three ribs representative of? Egypt, Lydia, and Babylon. These were the nations that were conquered by the kingdom of Medo-Persia. Then we go to the third, uh, third animal was likened unto a, a leopard. And who is the leopard represent? The kingdom of Greece. Good job, everyone. And it had four fowl's heads. And then it had four, sorry, four wings, four fowl's wings and four heads. What does wings represent, everyone, again? Speed or conquest or swiftness. What about the four heads? What does the four heads represent? It represents the four divisions of Greece, which basically comes down to the four generals that, that Greece had as soon as King Alexander the Great had passed away. And as a result, it was given dominion or power. Then we have the fourth, the fourth kingdom, which was likened unto a what kind of a beast? A exceedingly dreadful and terrible beast it had iron teeth brass nails and then it had ten horns what do the ten horns represent Rome was now going to be divided good job everyone and then after it's divided a little horn pops up which plucks out three horns we're going to discuss a little bit deeper what these things actually mean all right you guys ready to study Daniel 8 now that was the quick review of Daniel chapter 7. This is like the cheat sheet when you're studying for final exam. <laughs> All right, ready? Let's go. Daniel 8 verse 2, the Bible says, I saw in the vision, and it so happened while I was looking that I was in Shushan the citadel, which is in the province of Elam. And I said, and I saw in the vision that I was by the river you lie. Okay, let's read verse. We're going to look now into the ram now. We're going to look at verse 3. Then I lifted my eyes, and what everyone saw. And there, standing beside the river, the river you lie, was a what everyone? A ram which had how many horns? Two horns. And the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other and the higher one came up last doesn't this kind of sound familiar to daniel chapter 7 what we studied last night yes well we need to ask the question what kingdom does the ram and horns represent <clears throat> according to daniel chapter 8 verse 20 the bible says the ram which you saw having the two horns they are the kings of Media and Persia or Medo-Persia. So who is the ram representative, everyone? Medo-Persia. And what do the two horns represent? 
Good job. So the, the ram represents middle Persia and the horn represents king or kings. Does this make sense, everyone? Okay, we're moving on. Now, there's something interesting. We need to ask the question, who are those two kings? Who are the two kings that ruled in middle Persia, the, the major kings that ruled in, in middle Persia? It was King Darius and King Cyrus. King Darius was the one who conquered Babylon. You remember King Belshazzar? Remember he was drunk, he had a party, he had the writing on the wall. And then all of a sudden, King Darius came into Babylon and conquered the whole entire city of Babylon in one night. And as a result, from 539 to 522, King Darius was on the scene to rule in Middle Persia. Does that make sense, everyone? Then we have King Cyrus. After King Darius had passed away, King Cyrus ruled from 522 to 331, almost 200 years ruling during this time. And it was not just King Cyrus, there were other kings, like for example, King Artaxerxes, King Artaxerxes II. And so there were other kings that ruled, but these were the two major kings or divisions of Medo-Persia. All right, let's move on to the next verse. What happened to this ram? Verse 4, I saw the ram pushing where, everyone? Westward, northward, and southward, so that no animal could withstand him, nor was there any that could deliver from his hand, but he did according to whose will? Does the Bible say God's will? To his will, and he became, he became great. Now, the question that we need to ask ourselves is, who did Medo-Persia conquer in the west, the north, and the south? So who, we're going to answer this question right now. Who did Medo-Persia conquer? Does anybody want to take a guess? Who did Medo-Persia conquer with the three ribs in the mouth? Egypt, Babylon, and Lydia. And you guys are totally correct. In, in, in the west, they conquered Babylon in 539 BC. In the north, they conquered Lydia in 546 BC. And in the east, they conquered Egypt in 525 BC. The Bible is, is accurate and history basically backs up what the Bible says. So far, so good, everyone? All right, now we're going to move on to the goats. What does the goat represent? And as I was considering, suddenly a what kind of a goat? A male goat came from where, everyone? The west, across the surface of the whole earth, without touching the, the ground. And the goat had a what kind of horn? A notable, or another translation is a large horn, which was between his eyes. Now we need to ask the question, what kingdom does the goat and the notable horn represent? What kingdom does it represent, everyone? According to Daniel 8, verse 21, we don't have to guess. The Bible here tells us on the screen. Ready? Let's read together. Set, go. And the male goat is the kingdom of Greece. The large horn that is between its eyes is the, the first king. Here, we see that the goat represents Greece and the notable horn represents the first king of Greece. Now question, who was the first king of Greece? King Alexander the Great, you guys got it right. Who was the first king? The first king of Greece was King Alexander the Great. He conquered the world in how many years? In only three years, he conquered the then known world. He was swift, he was fast in conquering the entire world during his time. All right. What happened to King Alexander? Then he, King Alexander, came to the ram, that's Middle Persia, that had two horns. Who are the two horns? King Darius and King Cyrus, good job. Which I had seen standing beside the river and ran at him, that's Middle Persia, with what kind of power? Furious, it was angry, it was furious, it was, uh, it was very mad at, this ra uh, at the ram. Now what happened? And I saw him, that's King Alexander, confronting the ram, that's Medo-Persia, 
he was moved with rage against him. He attacked the ram and broke his two horns. Who are the two horns? King Darius and King Cyrus. There was no power in the ram to withstand him, but he cast him where everyone? Down, that's Pad Thai. Not the noodles, but Pad Thai means you're dead, Deba. Right? He was cast down to the ground and trampled him, and there was no one that could deliver the ram from his hand. So let me ask you a question now. Who won the battle between the ram and the goat? The goat, good job everyone. It was the goat, Greece. Through the leadership of King Alexander the Great, he defeated the ram, Medo-Persia, in the year 331 BC. Is it clear so far, everyone? Amen. All right, let's move on. Now, what happened to the goat? Therefore, the male goat grew very great, but when he became strong, the large horn, who does the large horn represent? King Alexander the Great was broken or in other words he died and then it says and in place of it four notable ones came up toward the four winds of heaven so all of a sudden you have king alexander being prophesied in daniel 8 verse 8 that he had died and as a result four notable ones came up to take control of the kingdom of greece now the question is what happened to greece after king alexander died well, here's what happened. It was broken into how many divisions? Four divisions. What are the divisions? Number one, Cassander. Number two, this Lysicomachus. Three, Ptolemy. Four, Seleucus. These are the, the four generals that the king had when, when, when the king died. These four generals took over the four divisions of Greece and they began ruling the kingdom again. Now what we're going to do is we're going to look at the little horn. This is the next stage, the third stage. What does the little horn represent? Well, let's read. In Daniel chapter 8, verse 9, it says, And out of one of them came a what kind of a horn? A little horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and towards the glorious land. Here's a question. Who did this little horn attack in the south, east, and the glorious land? Does anyone know? In most of the Adventist churches, people believe this, that these were the three kingdoms that were uprooted by papal Rome. The Heruli, the Ostrogoths, and the Vandals. And did you know that only papal Rome conquered these three kingdoms and had, totally, and had total world dominance in 538 AD. Did you guys know that? Okay, so now we're going to move on, verse 11. It says, He even exalted himself as high as who, everyone? The prince of the host, and by him, by the little horn, the daily, what everyone? Sacrifices were taken away. I'm going to stop you guys right here. The reason why I underlined the word sacrifices is because that word sacrifices is implied meaning to say in the original hebrew that word sacrifices was was shouldn't be there it was never placed in the original hebrew so you could read it without saying the word sacrifices you could just read the word daily so it says the daily word was taken away and the place of his what everyone the sanctuary was cast where it was cast down now we need to unpack this verse. There's a lot going on in this verse. We need to ask some key questions. Let's ask some questions. Ready? Who is the prince of the host? Anyone? Who is the prince of the host? Let's go to scripture in Joshua chapter 5 verse 15. Notice what, what, what it says. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped and said to him, What does my what everyone? Lord Jesus, say to his servant, Then the commander of the Lord's army, that's Jesus, said to Joshua, Take your sandals off your foot, for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. This is the only expression in the entire uh, Old Testament that the word Prince of the Host is used 
But it doesn't say Prince of the Hosts in English. It says Prince of the Hosts in Hebrew. And the way they translated in Hebrew was this phrase, Commander of the Lord's Army. Who is the Commander of the Lord's Army? That's Jesus. In other words, the Prince, the Prince of the Hosts is none other than Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? Amen. All right, now the question, next question is, what does the word daily mean? You remember the word daily sacrifice, sacrifice was never used in the original text. But what does the word daily mean? Well, here's what it says in Hebrew. Daily in Hebrew is tamid. Let's say that together, everyone. Ready, go. Tamid, which means continually. And it refers to the continual ministry of the high priest, that's Jesus, in the sanctuary who is daily working for our salvation. Meaning to say that this little horn power sought to remove Jesus from doing the work in heaven. They sought to remove Jesus from doing his work of saving people. Now, this is a picture of the sanctuary. How many of us have ever studied or seen a picture of the sanctuary before? <clears throat> what we're going to see here is that basically this is what the little horn did. <clears throat> I'm going to go back a slide. I want to read the, the verse really quick here. It says, He even exalted himself as high as the Prince of Hosts. Who's the Prince of Hosts? That's Jesus. The little horn exalts himself as high as... Doesn't that kind of sound like Lucifer who wanted to be like the most high? Okay. And by him, by the little horn, the daily were taken away. In other words, the daily continuation of Jesus' ministry in the sanctuary was removed. And the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Meaning to say, this little horn wanted to remove Jesus from the sanctuary. This little horn wanted to attack God from doing his work in saving souls here on earth. Now, what do I mean by that? Okay, we're going to look at the picture of a sanctuary. Okay, we have here the altar of burnt offerings. Before we get into this place, let me ask you this question. What does the little horn in Daniel chapter 7 represent? Papal Rome the papal Rome system, right? What does Daniel, what does the little horn in Daniel chapter 8 represent as well? It's the little horn or the papal, uh, papal Rome system, okay? It's not the people, but it's the, the system. Now notice what the system did. The system sought to remove the sanctuary from, from earth, I mean from heaven. He sought to get rid of the high priest, that's Jesus. How did he do this? How did the Catholic Church, how did the papal church system remove the sanctuary from, from heaven? Well, let me ask you this. Let's start here with the altar of burnt offering. What does the altar of burnt offering represent? It represents Jesus being sacrificed on the cross. Did the Roman Catholic Church, did the papal system try to remove the cross from people? Yes. How? How did they try to remove Jesus from dying for the people's sins? They basically came up with this idea saying that you don't have to go to Jesus for salvation. You can just simply go to a priest, confess your sins to him, and he will forgive you of your sins. You don't have to go to Jesus. Does that make sense, everyone? How about the laver? What does the laver represent? It represents the baptism of Jesus. Did the Roman Catholic Church substitute this, the laver, for something else that they have in their practice? Have you ever heard of sprinkling of the little children? sprinkling of babies that was their form of baptism you guys you guys see that yeah okay now what about the table of showbread what does the showbread represent the showbread represents the word of god 
Did they ever remove the Word of God from this, this planet? Yes. In what period? It was during the Dark Ages. You guys remember that time? They removed all the Bibles. In fact, they burned all the Bibles. And they removed the Word of God from this earth. Now, how about the candlestick? What does the candlestick represent? The candlestick represents the oil, which represents the Holy Spirit, to go out to witness. Was there ever a moment in this world's history that the light went off? Yes. What period was that time? It was known as the Dark Ages. They removed the light from God's people. In fact, only the priests, only their priests, could understand and interpret the Bible. That's, that's, that's their theology. Now, last but not least, you have the altar of incense. What does the altar of incense represent? It represents the prayers of the saints mingled with the, with the righteousness of Christ. Was there ever a point in the Roman Catholic Church that they ever uh, stopped praying to God and prayed to a human being? Yes. Who do you confess your sins to? You confess it to the high priest. And in fact, sometimes when they pray, they teach that in the Catholic Church that uh, we don't have to pray to Jesus. You can just pray to Mary. You can just pray to Joseph. You can just pray to Saint this and Saint that. Does that make sense, everyone? They basically was trying to remove the entire sanctuary from the face of this earth. Does this affect our salvation? Yes, it does. Why? Because now salvation is not by the righteousness of Jesus. Salvation is by works. Meaning, you have to work in order to be in the presence of God. That's what they teach. Does, does this make sense, everyone? Okay. Now, I want to make a disclaimer here. By any means, I'm not trying to offend anyone if you have been a Catholic or if you are a Catholic. By God's grace, all I'm trying to do is present the truth so that the truth shall set us free. Amen? And by God's grace, I'm sharing this out of a, uh, out of a heart of love because my family back home, they're Catholic. My dad's side of the family, they're Catholic. And my mom, she's Adventist. And so we have kind of like this tug of war this great controversy and so I, I understand if you've ever been in a Catholic home I understand what you're going through last but not least we have the Ark of the Covenant what's inside of the Ark of the Covenant everyone you have two basic things you have Aaron's rod that budded and then you also have God's Ten Commandments God's laws right they represent God's Word and God's Ten Commandments did the Catholic Church ever try to rewrite the law of God? Yes, everyone. And how about the Word of God? Did they try to have their own Word, their own Bible? Yes, everyone. They have their own Catholic version of the Bible. And so can you see that the object of the little horn was not just to destroy people here on earth. It wasn't just a political nation, but it was a religious power that was trying to attack God meaning to say their their aim was not to destroy people um, horizontally but their aim was to attack God vertically they were attacking the presence and the sanctuary of God himself let's move on in our story Daniel 8 verse 12 we're almost done here because of what everyone transgression what is transgression sin and what everyone an army was given over to the horn to oppose the daily you can take out the word sacrifice what was given to the horn to oppose the daily an army what is an army it's like military right you have the Navy you have Marines you have uh, uh, what else do you have Air Force you have the Philippine force, right? I don't know what you guys have here. But an army was given to the horn, the little horn. What do you think 
does the army represent? What do you think, what army did Rome use to help her defeat God's people? Rome used the power of what, everyone? The state, the state of Rome as its army. This is where church and state united in 538 AD and ruled until 1798. This is known as the Dark Ages. Does that make sense, everyone? This little horn was not just a political power, but it was a religious power which connected church and state. Church and state is now connected and all, and what they're going to do is now they're going to enforce through the power of the state using its army, a national Sunday law. And basically during the dark ages, if you did not accept what the Roman Catholic Church um, their doctrines and their beliefs, you are going to be killed. You are going to be pad thai, not the noodles, but pad thai, meaning you're going to be dead. And did you know during the Dark Ages, there were over 50 million Christians who had lost their lives? History tells us, history is so clear that over 50 million Christians had given their life during the time of the Dark Ages. Now, we don't have the time to look at all the martyrs. You can just read the book, Great Controversy, and you begin to see a list of names, such as Martin Luther, the Waldenses, Jerome and Huss, Calvin, and all these people, they were basically holding up the light, the truth, during the Dark Ages. So praise God that even though this church and state was killing God's people, God still had a people during the Dark Ages. Can you say amen? Amen. All right. Now we're going to look at the last part of this, this prophecy, Daniel chapter 8. This is the cleansing of the sanctuary. Why does the sanctuary need to be cleansed? Well, we're going to look at verse 13. The Bible says, Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another one said to that certain one who was speaking, How long will the vision be concerning the what everyone the daily take out the word sacrifices what is the daily represent again this is the work that jesus does in the sanctuary to save us does that make sense what does uh, i'll just explain it real quick what does jesus do in the sanctuary on a day-to-day -day basis he forgives you of your sins when you confess your sins he forgives you of your sins can you say amen he intercedes on your behalf. He prays for you night and day. He pleads his blood to his father. He's saying, he's saying to his father, don't let my people perish. You see my blood that I have shed for them? This blood is for them. Please do not destroy them. Give them more time. He's pleading on your behalf. This is what Jesus is doing. And the question is, how long will the vision be concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation, the giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot. Meaning to say, how long will the papal Rome be, continual, be continuing to rule and how long will they be continue to kill God's people? Does this make sense, everyone? This question is basically saying, how long until the saints who are living under the persecution of the little horn, when will they get uh, revenge? When will they get just, justice due for them? When is God going to save them? And then the answer is in the very next verse. Let's read this together, everyone. Ready, set, go. And he said to me, for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. I want to ask you this question. Why does the sanctuary need to be cleansed? And what sanctuary are we talking about here? Is it the sanctuary on earth or is it the sanctuary in heaven? It's in heaven. Why is it in heaven? I'll ask you this question. Why does the sanctuary in heaven have to be cleansed? If heaven is a perfect place, 
Why then is the sanctuary in heaven have to be cleansed? Does anyone know? What is being, what is in heaven? Besides God, besides his angels, besides Enoch, besides Moses, besides Elijah, what else is in heaven? There is a sanctuary in heaven that needs to be cleansed because our sins are up there. Does that make sense? Our sins are in the most holy place. Now, it doesn't mean that there is killing and there is uh, bloodshed or there is lying or there is prostitution in heaven. It doesn't mean that. It's the record of your sins. It's the record that's in the books. Remember in Daniel chapter 7, remember it said that the books were opened. What books were opened? It's the record of your life, your words, your thoughts, your actions, your sins. Everything that you have done from when you were born all the way to now or until you die, those are the records that was opened in heaven and this is what it's known as the investigative judgment because God needs to investigate all our all the he needs to investigate the books of our records the books of our lives the books of our sins and he needs to see if they are compatible with his word and with his law and if these things are not in comparison to his word and to his law, meaning to say, if they still clinged on to their sins, they will not be entered into the book of life. Does that make sense, everyone? So what were the books in heaven that were open? The books of our records, the books of our lives, our thoughts, our actions, our, our everything that we should have done that we didn't do our sins of omission, our sins of commission, every wrong act that you've done, every wrong thought that you thought of, all these things would be opened up in heaven and God is going to investigate and see, did my people surrender it all to Jesus? Did they give up their sins? Did they accept the righteousness of Jesus in behalf of their sinful life? And all brothers and sisters, that is what's going on in the judgment in heaven. Since 1844, God has been opening the books and looking at the records of humanity. The question this evening is, where is our sins? Are we still holding on to them? Or does Jesus have your sin? The best place for your sins to be is not in your own hands or hearts. It's to be with Jesus. Why? Because what does Jesus do with your sins? He cleanses your sins. And that's why we have the sanctuary that needs to be cleansed. Does that make sense, everyone? Now, the question is, when does this 2,300-day prophecy begin? When does it begin? Okay, I hear... 1844 I hear 1798 does anybody know when the 2300 day prophecy begins when you read Daniel chapter 8 it just says unto 2300 days then the sanctuary shall be cleansed but it does not give us a starting point the only way you can understand when the starting point happens is by reading guess what the next chapter Daniel chapter 9 so if you guys want to understand when this 2300 day begins how many of us want to understand when it begins you need to come back tomorrow night amen now I'm going to do a quick review in Daniel chapter 2 7 and 8 this is what we see we see Babylon in Daniel 2 it's the lion but notice it does not have a beast here in Daniel chapter 8 does anybody know why because the 2300 day prophecy does not begin with Babylon 
it begins during the time of Medo-Persia. And that's, we're going to see that later on tomorrow as well. Then we have Medo-Persia, which is representative as a bear and a ram. Greece as a leopard and male goat. Rome as a terrible beast, which is the little horn. Divided Rome, which is the ten horns. And then we go down to God's kingdom, which is God's kingdom over here. In 7 and 8, um, you don't see like the exact, but you see the major powers that are being paralleled from 2 and 7 and 8 as well. So basically, this is the summary of what we studied tonight. We saw a ram, we saw a goat, we saw the little horn, and we saw the 2300-day prophecy. When does that timeline begin? When does the 2300 day begin? Come back tomorrow and you'll find out. Amen? Uh, I have a simple appeal. <clears throat> How many of us want to be a part of God's kingdom? Amen? Because many times when we think of the word judgment, we think it's bad news. But when you read Daniel chapter 7 and verse 26, it says that the judgment was in favor of the saints. Meaning to say that the judgment was good news for God's people. Can you say amen? How many of us want to live through the judgment without being condemned by Satan or, or the little horn? If that's your desire, I ask that you please stand with me as we close in prayer. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much for this opportunity to study prophecy. For this opportunity to not just to know prophecy and to know the dates and to know the beast, the dragon, the lion, the leopard, the ram, the bear. Father, prophecy is not just knowing beasts. It's not just knowing the Antichrist but it's about knowing who Jesus Christ is. And Father in heaven, we pray, Lord, that as we study prophecy, Lord, Jesus told us that you told us these things beforehand so that we might believe. And so, Father in heaven, I pray, Lord, that you would help our unbelief. Perhaps some of us, we don't understand what prophecy is, Father, but I pray, Lord, that tonight, Tonight, they could have understand prophecy a little bit better. And Father in heaven, we want to pray, Lord, that each and every one of us here tonight would be in your kingdom, living with you in heaven forever and forever. Father, this is our prayer, Father, and I pray, Lord, that you would give us a desire to get to know Jesus better. Give us a desire for your word and give us a desire to share your word with others. Father, this is our desire, this is our prayer, for we ask all these things in the precious name of Jesus. Let everyone say, Amen.